Uh, thank you very much, Pia. I would like to begin, uh, as I always do, in acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners and custodians on, of the land on which we are gathered here today. And I'd like to extend that acknowledgement uh, to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present. Uh, in particular, uh, pay my respects to the Ngunnawal elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge Professor John McMillan, uh, Information Commissioner, to Jane Treadwell, CEO of Gov uh, Design Gov, uh, John Sheridan uh, from the Australian Government uh, Chief Technology Officer, Ian Fitzgerald, Chief Human Capital Officer, the APSC. Um, to all of the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I really um, always relish the opportunity to say a few words uh, at this event. Um, GovCamp has uh, established on the uh, national innovation agenda well and truly now, and it's a pleasure to be back. Um, the themes of inspiring innovation, empowering people and liberating capability invite us to aim high and think very broadly about innovation in government. And I'd like to begin by reflecting on these things and set the scene by discussing some of the broad ideas that have inspired me throughout my career and which still raise questions in terms of what we need to do to transform ourselves uh, as a society to meet the challenges of the future. Through the work undertaken by my department, um, the Department of Innovation and many others, we've identified the advantages of innovation in the private sector. And this has informed our policy development, of course. Um, we know that innovation can increase productivity through more efficient services and production processes, more effective workplace organisation and by opening up new markets. Innovation, innovative businesses boost productivity by investing in problem-solving capabilities, collaborating with customers, suppliers and competitors, adapting existing technologies and processes to new uses, and creating solutions to meet customers' needs. But productivity is not the only benefit generated by innovative businesses. Innovation active businesses are also significantly more engaged in the digital economy earning over $144 billion in internet commerce in 2010-11 collectively, more than three times that of non-innovative businesses. Innovation encourages a more connected and skilled economy with greater market diversity and consumer choice. And compared to Australian businesses that don't innovate, innovative businesses are also 42% more likely to report increased productivity, three times more likely to export, and 18 times more likely to increase the number of export markets that they target. They are four times more likely to increase the range of goods or services offered, and more than twice as likely to increase employment within their own firm. And more, three, more than three times more likely to increase training for their employees, and again three times more likely to increase social contributions such as community enhancement projects. So all of these are quite extraordinary credentials. Um, further, Professor Danny Sampson of Melbourne University and others, I will just turn my phone off, uh, of Melbourne University and others have identified what, innovative what an innovative organisation looks like based on some extensive analysis of successful innovators, both large and small, in the private sector. So I just want to go through these. These, such firms build innovation into every element of their work, whether it's strategy, operating practice, performance measures, rewards and recognition, and behaviour and culture. And in parallel with this, the Department of Innovation has identified the benefits of collaboration. Compared to innovative businesses that don't collaborate, we know that innovative businesses that do collaborate have the following attributes. I'm going to run through some more percentages with you, but I'm I, I want to make a very strong point about this. 23% more likely to increase productivity, 24% more likely to increase profitability, more than three times more likely to increase the number of export markets targeted, 48% more likely to increase the range of goods and services offered, 24% more likely to increase employment and job opportunities, and 34% more likely to increase training. So we know that firms that both innovate and collaborate do much, much better than those who don't. The commercial performance and their resilience in their respective markets is demonstrably improved. And we've also um, identified where these innovative, collaborative businesses get their ideas from. 
Um, these firms uh, get their innovative ideas uh, mainly from suppliers, 48 per cent, customers, 43 per cent, so both ends of their, their business, um, competitors and other firms in the same industry, 30 per cent, and related businesses such as parent companies or subsidiaries, 21 per cent. Now note that government and public research organisations are not explicitly on those lists of main sources. Looking beyond the organisation for inspiration, ideas, mentors, people and partners is an essential element for any change for any business, for successful change for any business. And this leads us, ladies and gentlemen, to design. Where organisations adopt a deliberate strategy to reframe their organisation's context in terms of the customer experience. Uh, it is an essentially an outward focused discipline. And this design thinking gives innovators a way to structure their approach to defining their context and finding a way out of complex dilemmas or indeed solving wicked problems. Now Jane Treadwell, who I know is here today, has described a major government initiative based on design and how it will help us reframe the government relationship um, with business in a new light. And I know you've heard, I think you're hearing, have heard or are hearing from Steve Beatty explain the value of design to organisations looking to transform themselves. So I don't think I need to elaborate too much on what I think is an essential and very exciting uh, direction in the future of innovation. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, I've introduced these themes of, of uh, innovation, collaboration and design in a private sector context because it's interesting to take these aspirations as a group and reconsider them specifically and all of the uh, um, commensurate successful outcomes in the public sector context. And I hope you'll agree at this point that there is a disconnect between the opportunities and best practices I've outlined and what we understand to be current practice in the public sector. The metrics will sometimes be different, but imagine a similar scale of transformation in the public sector with innovation, collaboration and design generating some real change. It's especially useful to consider these ideas in the context of open government. And whilst through the open government, uh, there are many of these themes that are, are actually already driving the level of change, it's also easy to see that secrecy and closed structures and processes are the enemy of collaboration and we need to break through to achieve new levels of excellence. The more open we are, the more innovative we are. The more innovative we are, the more we will achieve our social and economic aspirations as a nation. To fulfil the spirit of open government, public sector bodies do need to turn themselves inside out in this regard. This is not easy for institutions that have thrived as closed cultures uh, for the last 200 years or thereabouts. Nevertheless, the increasing complexity of modern government, the increasing complexity uh, and levels of expertise uh, and education of public officials, uh, the proliferation of communication technologies and an extraordinary level of public sector reform um, have steadily opened up government over the last, uh, uh, last, well, more than the last few years, over the last decades. But this opening up has often been selective and conducted on the terms of public organisations and public officials. The government's flagship strategy, therefore, for greater transparency and collaboration, I think is clearly embedded in its 2010 Declaration of Open Government, a commitment to open government based on a culture of engagement, uh, built on better access to and use of government-held uh, information and, of course, uh, that level of interaction and collaboration that extends beyond just a uh, service interaction. Um, to date, the government's considerable reforms in this area have focused on breaking down barriers to citizen access and, of course, stored information. Since 2010, the government has implemented and evolved a range of initiatives under that Open Government Charter or banner, and I imagine that um, Professor McMillan will discuss the current state of play, so I'm not going to recap progress to date. But ultimately, all of that success depends on individuals and organisations breaking out of old habits and old fears. 
Beyond the confines of the public sector, we need to harness what sits within every citizen, which I believe is a desire to contribute to the public good, the desire to make a genuine difference. And it's through the Declaration of Open Government and other elements of the Gov 2.0 strategy that we can build a trusted and open relationship with citizens that allows them to play their part in sustaining the health of democracy. So how can we take the spirit of open government further so deeply, so, so it is deeply embedded in everyday practice and guided by these principles of innovation, collaboration, design and ultimately empowering people through the digital tools available to them? How can we improve the engagement with citizens so they can have access to the people and processes that constitute the public sector and how they intersect with their day-to-day -day lives? I know that other speakers, uh, the panels, the workshops will have some good answers to these questions. But I'd like to raise one source of, of opportunity. The digital economy can contribute not only to continual improvement in government service delivery, but foster a level of transparency otherwise impossible in pursuing these opportunities. Um, it's the well-designed digital services and platforms that will build trust and confidence in the role and functions of government bringing government closer to the citizens and helping respond to what they want and need from their respective governments. It's partly about more effective service delivery models where the citizen is put first, and you've heard me say this before, citizen-centric services. But another part of what about that engagement is between politicians and constituents. How do we sustain the level, uh, a level of health in our democracy in how we communicate as elected representatives with the people in our electorates. And another, yet another, is the service agency that fully explain their services and deliver uh, to the people that they are seeking to serve. Um, the internet, social media, cloud-based services, mobility tools that we have at our disposal at this time in history offer an unprecedented opportunity to enhance government consultation and add new dimensions to public engagement. One of the most fascinating features of the explosion of social media and the internet uh, is the evidence of the public enthusiasm for that participation. It's a process of democratising uh, or democratisation of, um, of, of you know, civic engagement that, uh, from my point of view, is incredibly exciting to see. It's not without its challenges, nonetheless, and uh, the challenges to public sector innovation should not be underestimated. You, appreciate, you will appreciate, I know, the enormity of the challenge of changing the traditional culture of large, well-established institutions. In a resource-restrained environment such as the Australian Public Service, there is a risk that the implementation of Gov 2.0 will be seen as yet another task on a list that is already too long and under pressure. If we accept that new technologies are a catalyst for changing culture, we must also accept that traditional technologies and traditional cultures are deeply intertwined. These entrenched technologies and practices, therefore, I think aren't particularly well understood in this dimension of, in, in this era of engagement. But they've been adopted through uh, a process of, of, of custom of practice and uh, subsequent indoctrination of our public servants as they protect the traditional forms of traditional processes and the traditional forms of power. Over many years, uh, they become deeply embedded habits just learned by doing the same way again and again. I expect that the government's forthcoming digital economy strategy will update and complement uh, the Gov 2.0 initiatives by focusing on our broader digi uh, national digital capabilities. And I think this will provide significant impetus for the next phase of promoting this cultural and technological change uh, within government, uh, intertwined, as I said, as they are. In part, uh, this is about access and social inclusion, but I think most of you uh, will know uh, that as part of access and inclusion, um, that I'm incredibly proud to be part of a government that is building a national broadband network, the basis upon which that we can have the aspiration of universal high bandwidth access and all of the subsequent activities that can then occur 
uh, within that high bandwidth environment. We are, of course, a government um, that can plan uh, this transformation knowing that we are closing the digital divide and knowing that we will not exacerbate uh, inequities in the digital realm by investing in things like an open government strategy built on online citizen-centric services. It will take a little time, of course, to build the NBN. It's a big build. It is underway. And what we are doing now is in investing ultimately in not only the democratisation of information for our entire nation, but the digital empowerment of our citizens. From the perspective of the innovation portfolio, I see one of our greatest strengths is the potential for our high bandwidth network to underpin a level of co collaboration never seen before amongst innovative entities, be they from the public or private sector. The other area that the NBN facilitates is the development of skills. It's one thing to have a platform, it's another to have a population and a workforce capable of using it. By investing in our uh, national curriculum, by investing in a, a digital education revolution as we've had, we've ensured already that the next generation of school leavers will be uh, empowered to not only function, but function at a creative level. For me, it's not about having um, a nation of passive users either. And there is a, still a, a live discussion at the moment about the way in which we educate our next generation. And I've had several conversations over many years that this is um, far more than the digital platform for learning, but how we teach technology and the science, technology, engineering, maths suite of skills um, is going to be a key determinant on just exactly how much um, um, economic and therefore social dividend we are able to extract from our investment in the national broadband network over the, the coming, um, well, over the coming century. Um, what we do need is a nation full of people with confidence um, to both innovate and to collaborate and to understand the strengths inherent in those platforms and in that way of thinking. Um, we do, ultimately, um, this needs to be a challenge across both the public and private sector. Um, to, to be a nation with a, a, a national broadband network as we are creates an opportunity for us to be a test bed for other Western developed nations who can see the benefits of it. Uh, at the moment, I think, without this kind of thinking informing uh, those opportunities, we, uh, will, we will reap, um, uh, I think, several very important strands of benefits uh, from that investment, but not the broad economic um, benefit that I think stands there, stands ready uh, to be uh, extracted from it. Um, we are lucky, therefore, that in forums uh, like this and many others around the country to have minds turning to this task and the nature of this challenge. Um, I'm often asked, well, you know, who, who, who's pushing the boundaries when it comes to innovation in the country? Is it happening in the, the public sector? Uh, in this space, is it happening in the private sector? Um, where is it happening? Well, and, and how do those um, those case studies and the um, you know, offerings of inspiration um, become populated across our, our broader community? Well, the answer to that is um, innovation happens in the most interesting of places, and it's impossible to def define. Um, one of my challenges is to making sure that people know about it know about it when it occurs in the public sector and share that in, across the private sector and vice versa. And hence starting to build uh, the system of not only uh, innovation but the deep collaboration that serves to support all of our um, aspirations and goals uh, across both sectors. A clear implication um, of this for public sector innovation is to see it in uh, its leadership role. Um, the public sector is not necessarily uh, at the centre. We are part of a broader economy, but there are some things that we are able to do uh, in the public sector that the private sector can't do. And, and the same with the private sector. There are some things occurring within supply chains and so forth in the private sector that won't occur in the public sector, but the need to cross-fertilise and collaborate is still clear. 
I think we need to think beyond the traditional categories of policy development and service delivery in, within the public sector and play that broader role. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, in concluding, it's, a clear, it, it's clear to me that there is a long way to go to fulfil our aims for a transformed public sector, but it's worth remembering in the last five years or so uh, how far we have come. Um, it, of course, started with the Powering Ideas Innovation Statement, which placed public sector reform squarely within the national innovation system. The public sector innovation strategy, the Gov 2.0 task force, the report, the response to that and the declaration of open government, um, all of this coming uh, as part of a broader public sector reform, um, the blueprint for reform of the Australian government uh, administration, uh, the formation of uh, design, gov, um, initiatives within agencies and departments and across all spheres of government uh, which are world leading, world leading. Uh, through all of this, you know, I've made it certainly my business to monitor progress around the world. And within, um, within the space of a few short years, Australia has made its presence felt and has become, uh, I think, I don't, want to, I don't want to mention the GFC as a way as that that's why we've ascended because we were already there uh, and well on the way as the global financial crisis hit. But as that extraordinary pressure uh, became, um, was brought to bear on other budgets around the world as well, um, that has provided uh, Australia with an opportunity to uh, retain uh, its status and be able to shine in a very fiscally constrained environment in the public services across Western developed nations more generally. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the work we've done in Australia is something we can all be incredibly proud of. And I know that there are several people in this room who have, made, who have personally made an extraordinary contribution to Australia's progress. That's something you can all be incredibly proud of. Uh, the public sector in Australia uh, is held in the highest esteem, not least because of the work we've done, but for the potential of the work we are doing with an informed, early adopting population uh, in an environment where we are building a ubiquitous high bandwidth network for our nation and with a public sector culture that is clearly full of clever, innovative, forward-thinking people. Um, congratulations on your participation in, in GovCamp today. I wish you all the best for your deliberations. I, as always, will want to get a um, debrief, a report back on the things that you have discussed. And I note with interest the quality of your speakers and your panel uh, through the course of the day. So congratulations to the organisers. It's a pleasure to be able to share my thoughts with you this morning.